That'll go back to 403 BC when the Athenians adopted the more international Ionic alphabet, because before that it was Atticized, so it's in sort of this Attic way. For example, Homer's epics, they have a sound of a wa, like a W sound, called digamma. Well, that's not in Attic, so they don't write it. But yeah, that's the digamma. Our letter F is actually derived from that in, in form. So, uh, Zephs in modern Greek, or um, Zdeus probably would be the, the uh, best reconstructed Attic pronunciation. Ultimately, it comes from the dia ends up becoming something like a z. But meanwhile, the same uh, term, the same dia, uh, the eu, frequently gets contracted in just a u. Eu eventually comes into Latin as simply you. Pater, you meaning sky. I mean, that's the idea is that it has to do with sky or sky divinity or something like that. So the you pater is father sky, sky father, you pater, and then Jupiter, 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 pronounced Aegyptos, uh, Aegyptos, and that's that's where the word Egypt comes from. So what is Copt? That's from Arabic. Arabs coming in heard the the Gopt part. And we get wates in Latin from the same root as Odin, which is uh, wodaj. Uh, wodaj, the Z is retracted as wodaj in um, Proto Germanic. But uh, Veda is actually related to the word vision. The weid, uh, w, it's usually in Proto European, spelled conventionally W E Y D, weid. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with Luke Ranieri of the channel Polymath. And I'm showing on the screen right now. Go and subscribe to this channel. It is such a treasure trove of information on language. And this is a people who watch my channel, we, we like to nerd out. We love the ancient, we love the ancient Greeks, we love the ancient Romans. But language is like the glue that 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 keeps us all together like language tells us everything we're, we're it, there's so much to learn about the languages and then with learning that we can we can go on and and pick apart other things because that language is always what's behind everything yeah you know yeah and so i guess for a starting question for you i in one of your videos i was so fascinated by this and i really want to explore this you, you talk about in homer's epics there's 900 words that are unique just to Homer, and 300 of those are only used one time. You're now, referencing one of my my uh, my comedy videos where I, uh, <laughs> was, yeah, I, love, I was I made fun of the whole Greek language. Um, some in some ways exaggerated. Yeah, the the hapax legomen the uh, hapax legomena, meaning uh, said once, uttered once, and uh, yeah, those. Um, so I, I I guess you're wondering if that, is that's true or is that just exaggeration or yeah, what, what do you um, think about that? Yeah. Well, it's it's um, highly exaggerating the problem of learning ancient Greek, which has a lot of difficulty. And I'm, I'm delighted to talk about about those today because they're they're interesting and fun. And and uh, ancient Greek, especially compared to Latin, puts up all kinds of interesting uh, obstacles for us to get over. But um, yeah, you know, one of them about Homer is that uh, Homer's people want to learn maybe Greek for different reasons. Ancient Greek, of course. I mean. Um, and if they, maybe they want to learn, read the epics, read Homer. Unfortunately, very differently from, say, Latin, where the, the great epic, which is the Aeneid, that's written in essentially standard Latin. Yeah, there's poetical things here and there, but it's pretty much, you know, run, very much dead, dead uh, down the center of classical Latin. Uh, whereas Homer is not the classical or standardized form of Greek, far from it. It's this um, absolutely fascinating and bizarre amalgamation of uh, dialects passed probably down through oral tradition uh, for hundreds of years, all the way back from the end of the Bronze Age, assuming Troy, Troy, as far as we can tell, having to found that, that city uh, in, uh, in modern day Turkey. It seems like it could have been a real place. It's pretty close to Homer's description. It's a good bet that it could have ex really existed and been something historical. Um, and then, so it, the myth itself passed on by old tradition, the story, the legend, some version of it may have begun to exist right about that time, at the end of the, um, at the, uh, beginning of the, the dark ages of the, the ancient Greek dark ages, as they're known, and then passed by oral tradition through different dialects of ancient Greek, like Ionic and Aeolic, um, essentially almost different languages in the same sense that they're mostly 
maybe you could compare them to things like Galician and Spanish and Portuguese, languages that are clearly closely related, but you could have some mutual comprehension, but they're different. That's more or less the kind of uh, similarity or differences between those Greek dialects, depending on the century and so forth. And because of that, um, Homer's actual epics come down to us in a form that is, uh, if Homer actually existed, the ancients thought he did, and they, but they didn't have any you know, real facts to, to back that up so much. But they assume he did and that uh, he was blind, therefore he didn't write anything, but he could have composed it or took whatever he had heard and made it better. Uh, that's sort of the uh, the idea. So therefore, it's you have this mix of all kinds of amazing things, of dialects. Like, And the way that we know this too is that the way that Homer is normally, you find a text of Homer. Well, that's not how it was in the... 8th century, whenever, whenever uh, Homer was, because um, it's been, the spelling has been um, put into, obviously, modern orthography, lowercase, you know, periods and stuff. Okay, we got that. It was in capital letters and so forth back then. As far back as that, you know, majuscule goes back, well, that'll go back to 43, 403 BC, when the Athenians adopted the more international Ionic alphabet, because the Athenians were using a different alphabet, so it was standardized to that. But before that, it was Atticized, so it's in sort of this Attic way. Uh, for example, Homer's um, uh, epics, they have a sound of a W, like a W sound, called digamma. Well, that's not in Attic, so they don't write it. I was just but, talking about this. It's like that letter that they, they don't use anymore. It looks like an F. It looks just like an F, yeah. Maybe it might be curvy or something to make it look different than an F, so you don't think it's the same letter. But yeah, that's the digamma. Our letter F is actually derived from that in, in form. And uh, uh, so the... So they didn't have the digamma, but that's really important because if you have a consonant, then that's going to completely change the rhythm of the line. And that's how we know that it has to be there in Homer's actual pronunciation, however he might have recited it. And so you have to, and those can be restored, but there are all kinds of other things. So it ends up being this, uh, this amazing thing. So the, and the result is that we have a lot of these uh, unique terms that are creative. They're not necessarily, it uh, depends on what kind of term it is, but um, they're, they're terms he may have coined or things that, that came from other dialects all mixed together so that can increase the challenge mostly though i just put that in in that video to be an exaggeration for sort of reasons why not to learn ancient greek which is more of a joke yeah right wow that's fascinating because i'm yeah but I, I am trying to learn greek right now I'm, I'm in the process of i have a teacher who's we're actually using this book right here and we're also using uh where's okay. where's the other one that we're using uh, that's somewhere around here. Greek grammar sure. by um, is it where where? Or... I've heard. Yeah, no. I that, oh, is that uh? Yeah, no. I recognize the uh the name. I may have it actually. But... Yeah, it's just a black book that says Greek grammar, and I think it's mm -hmm. W I E R. I think it's the name of the author. Anyways, um, yeah. it's not easy. And that's that was the whole point of me me saying all that. It's there's a lot of things you have to know, especially when. It, it comes to the the, the different uh, the dative, the nominative, and genitive. You mm -hmm. have to, and then that those change up in certain situations, and then you got to just memorize when they change up. So it's, I don't know. Have you know, already studied Latin before, or no? Not really. Uh, yeah, it's it, that's I, harder because <laughs> they're really similar Latin and ancient Greek, but Latin's the easier of the two for say English speakers. Um, the yeah, only people that the same yeah. alphabet, right? Right. The only people that ancient Greek is easier for with respect to Latin are the modern Greeks who speak a language directly descended from ancient Greek. So it's easier for them. Whereas for us, who have so much vocabulary from Latin and some from Greek, but not nearly as much, we can get into Latin. So good for you. I do know some people who have gone right and exclusively into ancient Greek. Um, have you heard of the uh, metaphor climbing Parnassus? No. So Parnassus is a mountain in uh, in Greece, and it through especially in the I think Renaissance and after became associated with as a metaphor of doing something difficult, like climbing a mountain, like we'd say, like climbing Mount Everest or something. That it's it's difficult and arduous um, to get there, but it's very rewarding. It's a beautiful view. Um, it's uh, so it's climbing Mar Mount uh, Parnassus is learning Latin and ancient Greek, and especially ancient Greek. Great rewards, not easy, depending on yeah. how you learn. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a good way to put it, and that makes me mm -hmm. want to even. That makes me want to learn even more now. So I'm glad you put it that way. But oh, um, it's very rewarding. It's very cool. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I, you know, see it when I see my teacher reading the classics fluently, just like it's easy. 
I'm like, I wish I could do that. I wish I could just pull up a text of Sophocles and just start reading it. Like one day I want to be able to do that. So, you know, we'll get there one day at a time. But um, I want to ask you about, because you did a video about the gods. Uh, well, not, it wasn't just about the gods, but it was about the names of Jupiter, Dias Pater, Sky Father. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did. What? I did. How far back can we go with the with some of these names of these gods? I know this is not your specialty. You might not. This might be not. But what, whatever you want to tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. They, it's it's really interesting. And I, and being um, an utter novice when it comes to comparative uh, religion and mythologies, which very much fascinate me, but I know v- pretty much nothing. Um, it's so interesting too to compare the different uh, religions and how the different. Um, uh, pantheons interacted the way that for example there's the ancient greeks they talk about well there are these other gods the titans that were kicked out by the olympian gods right by zeus and all that so it's interesting to see those parallels and other yeah and other uh religions as if something like that happened or it, it, it to me and i don't know anything about this but it, it sounds a little bit like oh yeah when the indo-europeans came in maybe they had their own deities and that's sort of like a metaphor for that i don't know but um there, there are people who think that that's one of the theories floating around so yeah, and it's so hard to prove because they only started writing things way too late. <laughs> Thankfully, all that's very interesting. But yeah, the uh, so the uh, factor that's so um, profound, perhaps, is that many of the languages and through Europe and uh, through Southern Asia are all of one family called um, uh, the Indo-European family. Uh, this was discovered in the past uh, couple centuries. And the uh, so Greek, for example, and Latin have a, have a common ancestor in what's called Proto-Indo-European. And so we can reconstruct a lot of that, realizing first that, hey, these languages where the words for father in Latin, pater, in Greek, pater, and I think it's pita in Sanskrit. I don't know anything about Sanskrit. So it's, it's, it, they're clearly related. And then you start to realize, wait a minute, they're all part of the same thing. Lithuanian has something similar. And obviously the Romance languages do in German. So you start to realize, wait a minute, this is all one great big language uh, family. And based on that, you can start to identify things that are common and reconstruct stages backwards, like Proto-Hellenic. It's not a tested Proto-Hellenic. Um, usually Proto in front of anything is is not, uh, it's not attested. And often if it's not a test, you see an asterisk before the term. And these are extremely well uh, studied and carefully studied. And often it's very obvious the etymologies you can come up with a lot. And then so people uh, who have been scholars of this for the past couple of centuries have um, cataloged the various roots. And Zeus um, or Jupiter um, are, are, are part of this. So the, the word for, for day and the uh, word for, for Jupiter, evidently, they have a common origin. Um, one of them that seems like a, it would be a no-brainer, like, oh, those are etymologically connected. We know that Greek or Latin are related through Proto-Indo-European, uh, would be Theos or Theos in ancient Greek and Deus in Latin, but they're not. Uh, that word this Theos is has, isn't that weird? It has a different saw, origin. Yeah. I actually learned this from one of your videos, mm. and that for so long, I just assumed Dios, Theos, they got to be the same. It's, they're, yeah. both, they're both being God. They both sound the same. That's a slam dunk, right? Explain yeah. why why we know that they're not because I know people right now are going to be commenting. What do you mean they're not the same? I have always let's 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 get the lesson on this for my channel. If you don't, yeah. Well, me. Deus one or the um, or the uh, Zeus uh, one over in uh, meaning the the sky god, uh, right? So uh, Zeus. So how how that was? It's pronounced Zeus in modern Greek for any modern Greeks out there. Modern Greeks. Um, often have never heard that there's even an ancient pronunciation for ancient Greek. They believe that it was pronounced exactly like modern Greek. Uh, there are, which I, to me is, is bizarre because how can that be actually be taught in schools? But evidently it, it still is. So, uh, but there are, of course, many Greeks who do know it was different and they are curious and interested and, and uh, certainly leave lots of great comments on, on my channel. But so I, I like to mention the modern Greek pronunciation too to make sure that they, they know, hey, we're not trying to... Yeah, that's yeah. your language. So, uh, Zeus in modern Greek, or um, Zdeus probably would be the, the uh, best reconstructed Attic pronunciation. Ultimately, it comes from something like um, uh, you or diu, diu or um, uh, dieu, dieu, back into uh, Proto Indo European, something like dieus, dieus, something like that. So, the dia ends up becoming something like a z by the time it gets to um, Proto Hellenic. 
or a, a primitive form of uh, ancient Greek. So like, um, so instead of Zeus, uh, Zeus, uh, something like that, Zeus, something like that, Zeus, something like that is happening. But I'm giving us uh, Zeus as we, we pronounce it in English. Meanwhile, the same uh, term, the same Zeus, uh, the eu frequently gets contracted in just a u in Latin, for the most part. And um, so something like diu goes into uh, Latin, uh, dio eventually comes into Latin as simply you. And you, uh, the uh, you pater, you meaning sky. I mean, that's the idea that has to do with sky or sky divinity or something like that. So the you pater is father sky, sky father, you pater, and then you piter, you piter. Jupiter. Um, so that's how those are those are connected. Um, meanwhile, because the the way that that sound ends up coming out in ancient Greek, that dios um, coming out as teos, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. It, it doesn't um, because there'll be certain patterns of how things will regularly change, regular sound changes, and there are occasional exceptions, but that's not one of them. Uh, Modern Greek pronunciation theos meaning god or um, the uh, classical Attic pronunciation would be Teos. Um, it comes from a Proto-Indo-European root, which is actually uh, something like Des, Des. So it was an, so an aspirated D, those aspirated voiced stops, uh, meaning like a D sound with an H um, on top of it. They still exist in, all the way down to modern Hindi, which is descended from Sanskrit, and they have this D sound. So in English, we just have D, but Sanskrit and Hindi have D. Also in Proto and European was this the, this is the, the, and it uh, so that that ends up coming uh, in down that same term in the Latin um, because that the ends up becoming something like a a a, a v, v, a bilabial fricative in Proto Italic f, and eventually an f sound in Latin. So feriae, meaning days off or holidays, festival days, feriae is actually the term that comes from the same Indo-European root as theos does, which is interesting. So this theos is like festival, celebration of God or whatever, and that's that's where that comes. So it's interesting how they have, they, you would think they're the same, they're not. Another one that reminds me of that is folk and vulgus, and I have a video where I actually said that they're related, because I didn't bother to look it up. I just assumed, oh, they're the same, like vulgus, the vulgar, is related to folk, because the vulgus it means very much folk. It has the meaning of uh, common people. Yeah. But they're not etymologically related because that's not how the sound shifts work in, in Germanic. That was, video was a few years ago, and then I kicked myself for getting that wrong. Well, that's understandable. Well, and so so for Theos and Dios, it just happens to be that because the words sound similar and they sort of have a similar meaning, meaning they kind of, they're both relating to gods or deities, that's how they become brought together as being synonymous they, well they yeah they in ancient greek the word for god is theos in latin it's deus but it's um it's uh coincidental also because um is that an example yeah the, the vowel length so a whole, whole bunch of different features they uh, but I, I can guarantee you that the ancient romans and the ancient greeks probably thought yeah deus is just the 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 bastardized latin version of our classy greek word and the and the romans thought that oh Latin being a dialect of ancient Greek, which they actually thought, since ancient Greek had all these dialects like Doric and Aeolic and Ionic, uh, they thought that Latin was just a very distant relative of the Greek languages, which is true, but it's not descended from, you know, Hellenic. It's They didn't make that kind of association with, say, um, Gaulish, to my knowledge, you know, they didn't, yeah, but right. even though Gaulish and Latin are actually more closely related in a lot yeah. of ways. Well, that because that, that brings us to Etruscan, and, and there's a big there's a big mystery surrounding this Etruscan language. What do you? What do you? What do you? What is your take on this? Being sort of an expert in this, because I hear a lot of people make jabs at: is it Proto-European? Is it Semitic? People are say all types of things about it. What do you think? It's um, it probably well. It's interesting. It's Etruscan is classified as a Turanic language, and the uh, there's a sea. The sea that if you know the map of Italy, there's the boot, and then there are two islands out there: Sardinia and. Um, uh, in Corsica, and that sea that's in between them is called the Tyrrhenian Sea, and so that's their, these are, the Etruscans classified as a Tyrrhenic language. Well, what that just is is the ancient Greek word for the Etruscans, which is uh, Tyrrhenos, which um, ultimately is from, if I'm not mistaken, Turris from Tower, 
which is actually a Greek word, Tursis, uh, meaning the um, they had these they lived up on the mountain, so they had these towers, and that may be the origin of this of the Greek name that's uh, given to them. I don't remember where Etruscan would come, except if not from their their language itself. In any case, so it's classified as a Turinic language, meaning it's in the it's the Etruscans in the Etruscan family of languages. Great. Well, that doesn't really help us, does it? Um, there is, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but there is an island uh, if I'm somewhere over in, uh, in the Aegean Sea, so a Greek island, where there's um, attestations of something that, that resembles Etruscan, as I recall. But anyways, it's, um, what it seems to be is substrate, or we would consider that to be substrate if it were underneath, say, italic like latin or something proto-indo-europeans ended up migrating into all these places they must have had superior maybe agriculture or other technologies which allowed them to um dominate so many places so so easily so that their language caught on but the substrate languages whatever because you it's interesting to come do uh, comparative genetic studies for example um uh the genetics between um italians and and say germans um, uh, or the basic uh, genetic uh, kinds of things you can find in Italy and, and, and Germany. They're, they're different, in fact, because you, you see there's clearly uh, different like haplogroups that are associated with Northern European, and the gen genetics, for example, of the people in the Mediterranean are much closer. But their languages are so similar because they're all from Proto-Indo-European. So it's really interesting, and there, there, has, there are some um, Indo-European uh, genetic types. I don't know much about this, but the uh, the point is that it's so interesting the fact that you get a dominant language that ends up being not the language of most of the the people uh, that that used to be there. They end up giving up their old language and taking on a new one. We see this also, like say, French is almost entirely from Latin. There's yeah, there's some a little bit of Germanic influence into it. Almost nothing from the substrate Celtic. It's almost entirely like. Latin super popular, we're all going to speak that now. And they just, right. in a few generations, gave it up. It's really interesting how quickly languages can die. And it's actually very, can be sad to someone who's uh, very interested in the variety of, of languages. But it is uh, a fact. So uh, when it, but Etruscan, very weirdly, those people then never ended up getting um, uh, linguistically dominated by the Italic speakers who were all around them. And in fact, the Etruscans, for uh, whatever reason, they were good at sailing and merchants um merchant shipping evidently they built they made beautiful um pottery it's great greek pottery that etruscans had and, and greeks have such so they did a lot of trading in the pre pre-roman times and uh they're all, all beautifully uh, preserved in lots of places and so the etruscans ended up probably be, that was an element of their power that's some kind of power to resist the seemingly, seemingly irresistible force of the popular Indo-European language. None of this is really at all. It's archaeological, but it's not historical, and we just can figure out that this happened. And the trust can just survive. So they're probably speaking a language that was part of uh, the substrate. And it is attested in lots of inscriptions, especially funerary inscriptions and on pottery and a bunch of places. And I think the studies are improved to the point that we know even more about the grammar and uh, vocabulary than we did when I first looked at, at it um, back in like 2005. So... As the last I really looked at it, actually. Now I was, uh, I was going, I was doing a live stream. It was one of those long, informal, or just having some fun. And a friend of mine, who is real, he's really big into the Hebrew side. Um, so he can, he actually knows, he's pretty, he can read Hebrew and stuff. And he, he's convinced that Etruscan is either Phoenician or something. Let me just show you what we were looking at, and I want to, sure. I want to hear your thoughts on this. This is Certainly. really interesting. So this is from the Wikipedia page, mm -hmm. and it shows the Phoenician on top, and you see the Etruscan down below. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do look like they match. What oh, well, the, the alphabet, yeah. The alphabet's right from Phoenician and Greek, uh, and probably a mix of the two. The right, And that's a very interesting uh, thing. I'm glad you brought that up, too, because that's something that um, can often be a source of confusion. Um uh, because, and this is not something that's unique to modern times, but even ancient times, we once we become literate as a society, we start to strongly associate the written word for language. Right. Obviously, they're closely related, and they do have mutual uh, effects one on the other. But um, the, the it ends up going, I'd say, too far. For example, if one were to say, uh, look at this and say, oh, yeah, clearly 
since they have the same writing system, how can Etruscan not come from? Um, It'd be like saying Greek. German and English are the same because they both use Latin alphabet. Right. Now, and Ger German and English uh, happen to be uh, related um, through Proto-Indo-European, but the writing system, they took both of them directly from Latin and adopted that writing system as they saw fit, which is why, um, at least it's, that's a good example. Should I yeah, like, oi is O-Y in English, but oi is E-U in, in German, for example. There are all kinds of sound changes that are involved in that, too, but... Um, we use the alphabets differently in different languages. So the, yeah, the Phoenicians, though, they were the inventors of the first, I think the first, the first abjad would be the best way to describe it being um, consonant system, um, not really writing vowels. You have vowels right, um, representing uh, called, um, called matres lectionis, the mothers of how to read it is essentially what it means, where you have um, certain consonants like the ya, the yod, uh, which is is here, of course, the y sound equivalent to looks like a J in IPA who there, the yod or the w that like the wow, wow letter wow vav I believe is the modern Hebrew pronunciation of that letter wow, and um, letters like that are used to represent the long vowels, for example, that existed in Phoenician and Hebrew and Arabic. They're still used in that in that way where they're not writing all the vowels. So then the Greeks took. Um, the uh, Phoenician letters, and they um, they decided to use a lot of them for vowel sounds, especially when you compare the way that the Greek ancient Greek language works. Even it uses Protean European uses a lot more vowels morphologically, and morphology meaning how it uh, you decline a noun, how like like you were saying before, accusative, dative, genitive, and also um, a lot more vowels for uh, the uh, verb conjugations, for example. Ancient Greek in particular is really infamous for that, even compared to Latin. But that's really a more Proto-Indo-European thing, whereas you can get away with not writing them in, say, Hebrew, Arabic, Phoenician, and you would just know the correct vowel sound because it's you you speak the language. Where that's whereas if you have the difference between, for example, legi which means he reads in ancient Greek. And then you have uh, lege, which means he should read. Oh, sorry, say, I'm saying read, um, say. Uh, so legi, he says. Lege, he should say. And legoi, he would say. Now, if you only have consonants, you only have L and G. So how would you represent that really important morphological difference without vowels? Thus, the Greeks said, we need to have all of our vowel letters written. So they ah, did. I never thought about that. Yeah, and that's what we uh, so the Western Greek. That's the that's the uh, key thing. So the alphabet were borrowed by by the Greeks and the various um, uh, whoever started doing it isn't uh, well known. But there are there's a Western Greek variety and an Eastern Greek variety. The Eastern Greek variety ultimately leads to the Onic alphabet, which is a version of which is still used today in modern Greek and also in standard ancient Greek. Uh, but uh, Western Greek dialects, you, those people usually used the Western Greek uh, alphabet, as you see there. And so that, um, that so the, the, the next level we see after that is the Archaic Etruscan. Um, so it, and the, the best uh, guess and very good guess is that, in fact, the Etruscans who interacted with Greeks who were colonizing in the West, in Southern Italy, it's called uh, Magna Grecia today in Italian. It's actually a Latin term meaning Greater Greece. And uh, they saw that alphabet. They're like, hey, this is useful. Then we can write our own language in. And so they wrote that's, their own, own language. Like yep. Parmenides and Pythagoras, those guys are probably using that, that alphabet, you think? I have to remember what century they're in, but probably because it depends. Because I don't remember how popular the Ionic alphabet was before the Attic uh, language as classical Athens. In 403 BC, at the end of its classical period, they'd adopted that international Ionic alphabet. And then, but yeah, before that, and even to a later period, for at least a couple hundred years of the early Koine, we do see um, representations of uh, the uh, older alphabets being attested. But then back in, say, pre Roman times, this Western Greek alphabet was adopted by the Etruscans, most likely. Uh, and they modified it slightly. And that's also the how the Roman Latin alphabet comes about because they took the Etruscan alphabet and maybe mixed some Western Greek things in there as well. They're sort of on both Rome having to the north the Etruscans and the Western Greek colonists to the south. They were able to, well, actually they weren't exclusively Western Greek colonists, but anyway, it's called the Western Greek alphabet for, for that reason. So there, there you go. And, and it looks like they f mirrored the, the letters to get Latin. Like it just looks like what? What do you think? 
what do you think how does that happen like this it can't be like one day they came along and said let's let's flip the letters that had to have slowly happened but like how does that process even start well uh that's a great question and it's often from how they're written um because the have you heard of um bustrephedon no it's uh the it's it's how the cow goes when i did my um uh, geology undergrad uh, studies, or I always remember my professor, he would say, be the cow. That is to say, if you're doing, as you're an undergrad geology student, you want to, um, you don't want to go, you're trying to map, do a geological map of uh, this hillside. If you see all the layers where you have the contacts between different formations, well, yeah, you could climb right up that steep hill, but you're going to exhaust yourself. You have to be there all day under the hot sun. This is like out west and you know, Montana, those kinds of places. So, be the cow. The cows are out there because it's usually prairie land that cows are, are grazing on and that you just you can do, go and do geology research on. They're usually public lands, that kind of thing. What do the cows do? Well, they don't go straight down. They don't go straight up. They do switchbacks. And they make their own little switchbacks. So they go up and down. And uh, that's since cows do that, uh, the boo part in Bustrephedon and the, the streph is like um, uh, catastrophe, which means downturn. Or uh, strophe, like uh, the which means a verse in a song. Verse versus turn. Strophe, Greek means turn. Same thing. So it's, it's a turn back and forth, as a cow does. So that that's how the alphabets used to be in Phoenician. Um, all the writers of ancient Greek, Etruscan, and uh, it's it's really interesting. So they would write what they would do is they would, yeah. So they they could start right to left or left to right. Occasionally, you see some vertical stuff too. Uh, I've definitely seen some of that in uh, in certain places, in certain museums, but all, usually left, right, right, left, and just fill up that way. So letters are going back and forth, back and forth. So you have letters that look, and they, how do you know then which way to read it? Because the letters are turned backwards yeah, you can see from our, yeah. for the right to left, and backwards from our point of view. For them, it was just, why would you not do it that way? <laughs> I almost think that might be better to do. Then, like, going back and forth, why not? Let's do both, you know? It's but... fun. But for some reason, it seems like some places stuck to right to left, and the other places stuck to left to right, and then that that's there is no no, no one is is any is there any languages out there that do back and forth anymore? Or no, the yeah, and I if I recall, right to left. So right to left is easier if you're chiseling, if you're right-handed, which uh, the majority of people are, right? So if you're right-handed, it's easier to go that way. Uh, which would explain um, that becoming preference. But if you're writing by hand, most people are right-handed, then instead of, uh, as left-handed people out there know that one can smear the ink or the, the pencil graphite pretty easily. Uh, makes- and so left-handed people have to have become an additional technique that they, they learn at an early age to not smear. So usually that's why we, um, it seems, it seems, that seems to be the origin of left-hand, left-to-right writing is preferred if it's more on a um, uh, surface like paper, like painting on um, paint being dripped onto a papyrus, for example, the way the uh, the old style of writing in, in, in uh, antiquity, whereas chiseling right to left is preferred. And ultimately, uh, for whatever reason, the right to left style became the way to do it by hand permanently in Semitic languages, Hebrew, Arabic, uh, Aramaic, and um, a lot of Phoenician is like that, if I, if I recall. Whereas in Greek and Latin, uh, they end up preferring left to right ultimately. Wow, that that I, that is learned something new right there. That's so <laughs> fascinating. That explains the difference. Then that I, I let that literally that that answers that. Is it true that German is has has some ties to Eastern Sanskrit languages? Is there some sort of family bond going on there? That's the Proto-Indo-European language family. In fact, in um, in German, they call it not. The Indo-European languages, but the Indo-German languages. I don't remember the exact term, but it's like uh, I think it's like in, like Indo-Germanische um, Sprache or something. I think that sounds that's more or less what it is in German. I don't remember, but um, yeah. So because the uh, the all the these these various language families that are associated with uh, the Indo-European language family that all have some kind of origin somewhere around the Caucasus area. More or less where Armenia and Georgia are today. Um, who knows how they, they obviously, whoever those people were, there are archaeological studies about them. is very interesting. And there are some tantalizing historical bits nested in the languages that are descended from their language. So they somehow got a technological ability and they ended up probably agricultural, if I had to guess. Because if you have more agriculture, more food or a better way of doing 
um, the harvesting, then that means eventually you can have a surplus of food, you can have more people, you can have more cities, you want to, and you have expansion, which is very, um, um, very common, uh, common thing. So uh, the, uh, so the various uh, language families, Germanic is one, uh, Celtic, the surviving Celtic languages include uh, Irish, Manx, um, Brythonic, um, uh, and um, uh, Scots uh, Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, and the Romance languages, which are all derived from Latin. Latin, in a way, is surviving. It's not a living language. Uh, it's a dead language like ancient Greek uh, or Sanskrit and so forth, because there aren't native speakers who only speak that language, but they are very like well-preserved. You can have a full life only in Latin if you wanted to with speaking with other Latin people, you know, you don't, it's not like we're missing words or, or uh, vocabulary. Um, so Latin, the Romance languages, whereas the other Italic languages like Athkin and Umbrian, they're attested. We have some inscriptions and things, but there's not very much that you could like build a whole like literature based off of them. They're not so well attested. You'd be making up a lot of stuff. Um, and then uh, the Germanic languages mentioned, and the Balto-Slavic group, which includes the Baltic languages like Lithuanian and Latvian, and then Slavic languages, which include Ukrainian, Russian, Polish, um, and those are different groups, East Slavic, um, West Slavic, and South Slavic. And uh, Hellenic, the only surviving major member is modern standard Greek, and of course ancient Greek, and there are some dialects of modern Greek, uh, as they're, they're called. And in the way that if they ended up really distancing themselves, they could even be considered separate languages, varieties of Greek that are found in, um, it's called Pontic Greek in Northern, um, Turkey today. There are some, still some native speakers of a Greek. It's not modern Greek. It's very interesting. It has very different grammar than, than modern Greek Oh wow! in some ways. Yeah. Like the infinitive, like to do, to make, whatever the infinitive doesn't exist in modern Greek. That's completely gone. Oh, but wow. it does still exist in Pontic Greek, which is what it's called that northern um, northern Anatolia or Turkey, where there are some people there still. And also in southern Italy, um, it's called Grico there. And there are some different pockets. They speak different varieties that are uh, ultimately go way back to those colonists um, yeah. in, uh, in deep antiquity. But uh, the uh, so all of these and then going further east, we have um, the Indo-Aryan languages. Uh, so those would be the uh, Aryan, of course, uh, has... Technically, it has nothing to do with um, Nazi Germany, uh, but the yeah. term, because it was evident that, hey, there is this people, this Indo-European people that ended up bringing their influence and their language everywhere. And that's what they were using in World War II Germany to say that was our claim. And they, they called them. That's where, the, that's where this idea of Aryan and all this, that nonsense came from. All of that's based on something real, which are um, uh, the language family, which is called Aryan. Modern Persian uh, or Farsi is derived from that, as well as Hindi, uh, Urdu, and uh, yeah, those are. It's, it's fascinating. And then so back because we, we I got to keep reminding myself about the difference between the writing languages and the lang and the spoken languages. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when people will talk about Sanskrit being the oldest language, and is this because they're speaking the language that they're speaking is the longest li living language? And what's the difference between that and the writing system that they're using? And I guess this is part B. The writing system that you see for Sanskrit, where does that come from? Right. Uh, it's endogenous, if, I don't, um, if I'm not mistaken, meaning it, meaning it came from the um, speakers of Sanskrit, this, uh, the uh, Devanagari, which is still used as the alphabet of Hindi. Um, that's his name, Devanagari, like we have the alphabet. They call it Devanagari. And the and that Dewa, if I'm not mistaken, Dewa is connected to um, to a Divust and divine over in in, yep. in West. If I'm not mistaken, I think it means divine, yeah. it's divine writing or something. In any case, that's a great question. Yeah. So when um, uh, the oldest language, I think oldest attested language is a good qualifier for that because Sanskrit is attested at compared to the other languages in the Indo-European family, it's attested quite early. Um, and uh, it's not the oldest attested language. Uh, those would be um, Sumerian, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Chinese is also very old, uh, where it has uh, very early attestations of the first writing that's ever done. But in the uh, our great big Indo-European family, which includes English, of course, uh, yeah, the Sanskrit's the oldest attested, and it's a very rich literature as well, which is pretty cool. So that answers that. And so 
so the when Sanskrit starts getting pen or write, written down, they're basically making their own symbols based off what everyone else is doing. Because it's like the idea of a of an alphabet seems like that seems like a specific thing, or maybe it's like two different beavers building a similar dam. They don't like maybe that's just naturally how we do it. Well, that's like, interesting. You know, the, the alphabet is done differently in Devanagari, and I. If it was, for example, was it influenced by varieties of uh, cuneiform or um, or the Phoenician alphabet, for example? I do not remember. And I'm sure yeah. Wikipedia has a good page on, on that as well. But um, uh, yeah, it does some things differently. For example, the way that vowels are represented and how it's all linked together. It's all very cool. Um, I, uh, I learned it once upon a time like, a couple of decades ago, and I haven't looked at Sanskrit since then. Is there a lot of different um, sounds for letters? Like, is it a lot more than just twenty something? Sanskrit and uh, and Hindi to a lesser extent, but but not 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 bad. Really preserves a lot from Proto Indo European, as does uh, Ancient Greek. Uh, but Hindi Sanskrit really preserves a lot, especially um, something I was talking about in one of those uh, recent videos about um, aspirates. So there are a really fundamental, important part of Proto Indo European phonology was the difference between aspirated and unaspirated consonants. So we we have this in um in uh, in English as a contrast but it's not phonemic which is a linguistic -y term uh meaning it makes a fundamental distinguished unit in the language. A good example would be say l and r in English. l and r are not the same sound. They're phonemically different. Uh, that is, those letters represent sounds. But it's interesting because they L and R have different realizations. Uh, for example, in the beginning of a word, we might say like run, but car. Now, we both as English speakers interpret that as, well, yeah, it's an R sound. What are you talking about? But then think about how that's actually different. R and R, the, that's, it's similar, but it's not exactly the same thing, how it's articulated. Then think of British people. British people have no problem who, for example, have a non-rhotic, as it's called pronunciation. They'll say call. They're not going to say car, though there are Brits who actually have an accent like, or a pronunciation like that, but it's not very common. The non-rhotic version where they say call um, instead of car, well, that's still the R. In our American minds, you think they're not pronouncing an R, but if that R weren't there, it couldn't have that sound, that the sound of call is actually still a pronunciation of the R. It's just very different from how we do it. It sounds kind of absent, but it's still there. So what that is is called an allophonic difference, that there are two phones or voices or sounds. It's allophonic, and allo, allos means other in Greek. So allophonic has a different sound, but it's the same phoneme. It's always an R. It just does different things depending on the environment. And the L, too. In British English, for example, um, American English, our L is pretty much the same for the most part, depending on where it happens in a word. But like the difference between uh, light and fall, it's just an L. But even with light and fall, my, my, my L, my tongue is doing something different. In British, it's more pronounced depending on the accent. But um, a British accent would normally do something like uh, light, la, light, and then fall. And, and that all is very different from the la. And they call that a bright L and a dark L, respectively. Um, and there's different terms for that. So the point of, of and my, I don't have a very good you know, British accent, sort of an imitation of it just to, to make the point. But um, the difference is that it's still the same phony, but has different realizations. We also have that with uh, aspirates. So aspirates are really cool uh, because, uh, well, for example, we say um, pin, pin. Uh, and you can say it too, pin. Like the, to for, pin button or something. pin, yeah, and then uh, but if we say spin, 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 yeah, so same letter as far as we're aware, yeah, it's just the letter P. What's the big deal? Well, the difference is that if it were Proto Indo European or Ancient Greek, completely different phonemes, even though it's still a letter P. What's going on is that the P, when it's initial in English, also true of German, most of this, when it's initial, it's aspirated. Meaning there's an H sound that's on top of it as you say it, pin, pin, pat, pool, whatever. But when you put an S in front of it, pin and spin, we hear just S plus a P sound. It, there shouldn't be any big deal there. But what's going on is that after an S, the P 
doesn't have that extra H sound on top of it. So um, it's not, for example, spin, spin. That sounds weird, right? Spin. But it's exactly how I say pin, pin, spin. But one of them is sounds kind of weirdly emphatic and not natural and not what we do as English speakers. And whereas if I don't put aspiration on the P for the word for the word pin and I say bin, bin, someone's off. It sounds kind of like uh, a Spanish accent in English. The reason being is that this phenomenon of aspirating initial p, t, k, it's uh, something that we do in English, but only happens initially or before stress syllables. So initially meaning the first letter of the word. So it's how basically how our English language speaking ancestors going back pretty far before stress syllables uh, in English, we also get aspiration like a Paul uh, or a peer. It's not a ball or a beer. And it's not, what's when I de-aspirate a P, when our English mind expects it to be aspirated, it sounds like it's a letter B. It's not. It's a little bit different. It's not a ball. It's a ball. And I know that sounds almost identical to an English, even to me. And I'm, and I know, and I, well, I think I know what I'm doing. I'm trying to, trying to do exactly what, it, what I intend to do is to de-aspirate a P sound, a ball. Um, and it's interesting because this, uh, th this is a um, allophonic difference of the phoneme that we call P. But it's also true of the T sound um, and the K sound. Uh, so uh, like uh, cat and scat. It's not scat, but it's cat. And if I de-aspirate the, the K sound of cat and I make cat, again, it sounds a little bit like um, an accent of uh, like a Spanish accent in English or an Italian accent in English, because those languages don't make an allophonic contrast. They're pretty much de-aspirated for, for a lot of them. Sanskrit is really cool it's because it has these aspirated uh, stops. So our stop, there's this linguistic term is for different kinds of uh, uh, different sounds. So um, uh, a stop or an occlusive or a plosive, it's all the same thing. Stop is sort of the more modern way to call them. Stops in English are, be, are like P- uh, p, t, k, and b, d, g. Those are the six phonemic stops in English, even though they have some variations um, allophonically, depending on where they come on a word. And uh, Sanskrit has all of those and aspirated versions of them. So oh. Sanskrit has p, t, g, but also has p, t, k. And those are completely different, as different as r and l are to us, as different as b and p are to us. I got, that, you. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. And Sanskrit also has aspirated versions of the voiced ones, which so are it's, 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 it's similar, similar part of your, that's what you're doing with your tongue, but a little bit of a tweak. It's just, it's an H sound. It's just like an English H sound on top of at the same time. Um, it's uh, they're not two consonant sounds in succession. The simultaneity is a critical factor in doing these um let's say correctly, uh, in the way that they occur naturally in Sanskrit or ancient Greek. So pataka, but Sanskrit, and differently from ancient Greek, which doesn't have this, uh, Sanskrit has um, the voice stops also aspirated. So it has badaga, but also has badaga. Mm. And those are different. And I remember my brain melting the first time I heard that when I was trying to study like Sanskrit and, and Hindi. I was like, wow. It's just like, how, really? That's different? And I heard, I'm trying to practice audio, and I heard this, the voice do, ba, da, go, ba, da, go. And I'm like, what? Those couldn't be different. It's very well, interesting. To, go ahead. Well, so the Greeks have the ki and the he. Right. And, and so someone on the east might say, that's the same thing. And we're like, oh, well, no, it's not. That One of them looks like an X, and the other one looks like a K. Right. So like, they sound a lot similar, and they're almost used interchangeably. Almost, I'm not going to say they are, but you know, you, like "bak kick," "bak kick." Like you can almost see how those words can That's be translated. Right. You know, beta, trans alpha, cap, uh, chi. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, bakos, bakos. Exactly. If it weren't a chi, a, a, a chi, and if it were letter kappa instead, it would be um, bakos. With it, it's bakos. So you hear an H sound. The problem exactly. yeah. is that we don't, as English speakers, we can relate to it because we do do that if a stress follows, like if it were a uh, bakos. But then we also have to train ourselves not to aspirate it when it shouldn't be aspirated. For example, a word like, um, I'm making this up, like bakos. So bakos and bakos have to be different. 
Bacos and Bacos sound as different as pen and spin. They sound completely different to native speakers now dead of ancient Greek or modern uh, living Hindi speakers, for example. And that's something that's, I'd say that's probably the biggest thing to get used to when learning any language is, no ma and I always find this, no matter how much you learn about languages, I've had the benefit of, of living in a number of countries and studying a lot of languages. No matter how much you learn, there's always something really surprising around the corner. And especially through the, because um, we only understand the world, and I'm, I think your channel has to do with, with that a lot in your, your own research, is, is um, conceptual frameworks. And internally, we, we, develop, we have internal grammar, we have internal vocabulary, obviously, we also have internal phonology. And when we um, come upon something that's not familiar, or that's not exactly the way that we do or say something, uh, we react to it in different specific ways. For example, the way growing up um, as Americans, we normally like British accents. And we do they sound all all charming and and, uh, and elegant because we associate them with like the characters in Downton Abbey or the Queen or all these other things that we see as kind of far off and nice in these fairy tale lands and Shakespeare plays and all those things that say, oh, that sounds really elegant and nice. And um, uh, it was interesting because that accent, that RP accent, is actually derived from a lower class accent in the previous century, in the, the 19th century. So it's interesting how these things develop and we have these perceptions. And another one comes to our, um, something called phonotactic limitations. Phono and then tactic. Basically the, the tact part is order in Greek and the phono is sound or voice. So the, the, um, the, the limitations that we have due to our native languages or the languages that we know or speak well. For example... I remember when I learned how to actually do the ancient restored pronunciation of classical Latin. And it's different from the ecclesiastical pronunciation. It's different from Italian. And my, my bias is that, because I already knew how to speak Italian, my first bias was, it doesn't sound like Italian. That's wrong. And it's interesting. And I'm not alone in that. Italians often think that too when they hear it. They think, oh, you, because now, of course, I use that pronunciation a lot, the restored classical pronunciation. And Italians will comment, you're doing it wrong because you're an idiot English speaker. And I have to tell them, I tell them very patiently, and they write in their adorable version of English. And I respond to them in Italian because they're obviously Italian because it's like, I don't know, Silvio, whatever. You know, it's like, okay. So, ciao, Silvio. Grazie per il commento. Hi, Silvio. Thanks for the comment. So, what you're talking about is the ecclesiastical pronunciation. And believe it or not, it's only used in schools in Italy for the most part, whereas the rest of the world happens to use this thing called the restored classical pronunciation that you haven't heard of. so you go through this thing and i i make a point to do this because one person at a time you know because if you have a whole education system and it's much more like this in greece where in um they you usually most italians have had some notion that there's a different pronunciation in antiquity even if they haven't heard it very much uh greeks uh very seldom so it takes a lot of a lot of patience to deal with this and then when we get to something like the aspirates in ancient Greek that are a fundamental part of how that language works. Like what, what the interesting thing about phonology, what, who cares? It's a dead language. You pronounce any convention you want. And I say, yes, absolutely. But there are certain characteristics that if they're not observed, if we don't understand them, if we don't utilize them either in conversation, if we actually speak the ancient language, or if we, we don't do, if we don't have a command over them, yeah, there's a level of artificiality in any case, and that would just make it that much more artificial. That's fine. But if they're fundamental to their grammar, to the structure of the words, we definitely need to know how they work, even if we don't use them. And there are lots of examples of this. So this makes it, um, I don't actually use them in ancient Greek. I tried to, and I was using them for a while in ancient Greek and recitations of things saying like, um, uh, what's a good example? Um, bos means how. Bos. It's pi, os, oh, oh, pi omega sigma, pos. But, ha, but uh, the word for light is pos. So it's the difference between pos, 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 pos. And there's an H sound on one of them. To you and me, to English speakers, that is so, and most people, by the way, in, in Europe, it's so subtle that you can't even tell the difference. But in ancient Greek, that's how it works. And in Hindi, that's how it works. In Sanskrit and a few other languages that are uh, around and living today. And if you learn that modern language, like say Hindi, and you can't make that distinction, you cannot be understood, you cannot communicate. So the issue is then that, wait a minute, if that's the classical pronunciation in, in ancient Greek, I, I tried doing this and I would encourage people to do it. And I found in uh, at a recent video where I talked about this, that ultimately this was not 
effective pedagogically because you have to, unlike like people can learn how to trill an R. If you don't know how, how to trill an R yet, you can probably learn. Most people who are English speakers, even though we don't have any, we can figure that out. That's tough. Some of the harder ones we get at. But distinguishing pos and pos, did you, uh, it's like you, if I say ra or ra, you can hear there's a difference, even if you can't right. do it. And that's a problem uh, because it becomes this huge impediment, which is um, then about, then you start to talk about, okay, convention, maybe some conventions that are clearly easy ways out of this complexity, where we say, um, instead of saying ka ta pa, we're saying ka ta fa. Maybe that's just better because at least then we know what letters we're saying. Because otherwise, if we can't do it, if we don't master it, we just complete loss of communication. And it's very interesting because there's a, um, and the point I think was bringing up is that how much resistance there is internally that we all have based on our own phonotactic limitations. Wow, that was very fascinating. And I, that, that explains a lot about how we speak and how we listen and write things. That that really did make a lot of sense. Um, so thank you for that. I have two more questions. The first one, to stay in the same Indo-European world, there's a lot of people who I who I get this question all the time. Obviously, I can't answer because I'm not the expert, but I hear I still get it in the comment section. I wonder if the god Odin is phonetically connected to the Vedas, the wisdom. What is your thoughts on that? They have similar sounding uh, roots, and we get wates in Latin from the same root as Odin, which is uh, wodaj, uh, wodaj, the disease retracted just in wodaj in um, Proto Germanic. But uh, Veda is actually related to the word vision. Um, uh, the weid, uh, it's usually in Proto European, spelled conventionally W E Y D, weid, that root. And weid comes into. Um, a proto-Hellenic as uh, something like uh, like weid, uh, weidon. It, it gives us the uh, the w is lost and the a gets becomes e, and in say Koine pronunciation be something like idon, which means I saw idon, idon. And that same weed or weid comes into italic as weid. Um, something like weideze was um, was a pronunciation in proto. Italic and eventually becomes widere in standard uh, Latin, which means to see. And that gives us visio, visum, and also a visa, something that you saw my documents, a visa. Yeah. Um, so that th there is a uh, connection through Proto European, but they have slightly different roots. It's interesting because it, there's all sorts of strange little complexities with the sound changes that show that, yeah, they are real similar how they ended up, but they don't actually have the same root. Yeah. It's almost like the Theos Dios thing where you see these two words, they sound sort of similar. They're both kind of religious terms. Yeah. But once again, it's one of those coincidences that are very interesting, you know? Yeah. It's like folk and uh, vulgus or vulgar, which is actually a folk etymology, an etymology which isn't actually based on. Uh, linguistic reconstructions where you just see the similarity. Like this is like all the people in antiquity did. I can't think of any particular instances, but I'm sure the Romans thought that, oh yeah, theos is just theus. It's clearly the same word in our dialect and from the same origin. We got it from Greek, I would say, because they wanted to be from Greek. Oh, I, I thought of one. Elagabalus and Heliogabalus. Ah. The Roman emperor, they thought his name was tied to the god Helios. Ah. But, I've, but, it's, but recently, some of, I forgot which scholar it was I was talking to. So it was just a coincidence that, that, that they, they they made that connection themselves mm. when he, Helios is something completely it's like Doric or whatever Attic I don't know who knows you you might know actually but Elagabalus is like some Syrian name has something to, oh, to I'm yeah I'm not familiar with with that name so uh, sure, yeah sure all the time to, uh, yeah so yeah. it's fascinating I love this I love the looking at those connections and like trying to find out where they come from but um. Yeah, anyways, uh, last question for you is about we're going down south now in Egypt. And it's the cop when we look when we look at Coptic, especially the Coptic alphabet, it almost looks very similar to Greek. Is it a native language to the Egyptians or is it some sort of Greek influence going on? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, so the Coptic language is descended uh, from an earlier stage of Egyptian. Essentially, there's a, a continuity of different dialects of Northern and, and Southern Egyptian languages, 
which get represented in uh, written form early in the form of um, hieroglyphics. And there are various stages of, uh, of old Egyptian and middle Egyptian, which is uh, classical Egyptian. So the classical, like classical Latin or classical Greek, but it's up that it's 2000 years before the Romans. It's a long time ago. Um, and then uh, the and then a new Egyptian leading into uh, Demotic and Coptic. It was very interesting too, and this is especially partly the fault of various scholars, is before really understanding the languages, one could distinguish really only the writing systems. The languages are associated with the writing system, but you could write anything in hieroglyphics if you really wanted to. You could write English in it. You would have to come up with a special way to do it, but you could do that, and you could uh, write... Um, you could write Egyptian with the Greek alphabet. And the later stage um, of Egyptian, its last living stage, was written in the most popular alphabet of the day, which was the Greek one. Modified. In the same way that we have an English alphabet that's different from the Czech alphabet. The Czech alphabet is just a Latin alphabet. But Czech has a couple special symbols, like an R with an upside down circumflex on it, and like it means zh. So it's still a Latin alphabet, but it's a Czech alphabet. Um, the Coptic alphabet is like that. It's And it's often traditionally, still looks like it's written in a really cool like uh, papyrus ink pen. So the Coptic letters, they usually look really virtually identical to Greek uncial letters of, you know, 1700 years ago. Um, and uh, they just, unlike, like, uh, the, there was, a, when was it? It was the mid-19th century, if I recall. There was an attempted reform to the writing system of Coptic, because writing, because Coptic remains the liturgical language of the Coptic Orthodox Church. So they wanted to make it, I guess, easier to read. So they thought, hey, let's put on lowercase. Let's make it just like modern Greek has done. And there was resistance, like, no, nah, no, nah, is let's keep our, keep it the same. So Coptic retains no difference in capital and lowercase. Uh, you can use punctuation and all that, but it doesn't. It has other diacritical marks, but it doesn't. So it looks like an archaic Greek, an archaic ancient Greek alphabet. It looks like the way that ancient Greek is written in all papyri. Um, yeah, so that's where the Coptic alphabet comes in from. But the language itself, does it have any influence from Greek? A few words liturgically, because it is... Um, its main existence uh, came out of a desire to write down the Bible, the translate the Bible into the native language of Egyptians, which uh, we call Coptic. But Coptic is interesting as a word because Coptic, where does that come from? Because the um, the uh, the language, uh, like Egypt, is just it's Kemi in in Coptic Kemi. That's that's Egypt. So in and then I'm in Kemi. There's this Rom word in Coptic Rom, which means persons, and when it's prefixed, you get Remen, so re, and that in is a connector, so Remen Kemi means person of Egypt. Therefore, generically, adjective for Egypt or Egyptian, so Remen Kemi. So what do, um, um, what, what we have is then um, Egyptian. We get Egypt from ancient, from Latin, which is Aegyptus. Uh, and in, say, classical Attic, it's pronounced Aegyptos, uh, Aegyptos. And that's that's where the word Egypt comes from. So what is copt? That's from Arabic. Arabic speakers coming in the 6th, 7th century. I don't remember exactly when. They arrive there and the Egyptians say we are, they call themselves, we're uh, using the Greek word, um, something like that. They probably didn't say it quite like it is in classical Attic. But they they heard, the, the um, Arabs coming in heard the the gopt part. So we see wow. G-O-B-T. Gopt for the Aguptos, Aguptos, something like that, Eguptos. So they heard that, the Gopt, and Gopt, um, it gets pronounced differently in different places as Gopt in, uh, for different Arabic speakers. And now it's just the, the name um, used to help classify the uh, Egyptian language in its last living stage from early Roman Empire times until it lived for a while. It was only finally went extinct about 500 years ago, or went became dead, I should not extinct. Um, and there, there were a couple hundred years ago, there were still, I think, a few living native speakers, but I think they're all gone now. So it remains as a language that's that's um, studied, like Latin and, and ancient Greek, but uh, it didn't... It's such a shame, because it's the, it's the longest attested continuous language um, change. I mean, modern... or modern, the, the Coptic language is so different from Middle Egyptian that I wouldn't call them the same language. No, the same way I don't call Italian and Latin the same language or ancient Greek and modern Greek. They're descended one from the other. They're very cl closely related, but they're 
they're pretty different in how they use grammar and phon phonology and vocabulary. Greek influence in vocabulary does happen to Coptic. So the words like uh, um, angelos is used in uh, Coptic for an, it's uh, angelos in modern Greek, angel, and um, a number of words. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, the word for peace. So the word for peace in Coptic is hirene. And by the way, I'm using a reconstructed like third century BC co uh, Coptic pronunciation. Liturgical Coptic pronunciation was reformed in the 19th century to be more like modern Greek. So the let, if it looks like a Greek letter, pronounce it like a Greek letter. That is like a modern Greek letter, which is a shame because it ended up leveling a lot of the really interesting things that develop naturally. So there's um, the pronunciation oh. of the liturgical di dialect, which is called Bohairic uh, or Bohairic, B-O-H-A-I-R, Bohairic. Um, that, uh, that, that dialect has a lot of really interesting things that when it was written down, it preserves a lot of things from ancient Greek phonology too. Um, so uh, anyway, so, uh, th th so it's, it's, they usually say, I think, um, something like hirini in um, liturgical pronunciation today. I say hirene. Um, now what that is, is oh, it means peace. And if anybody out there knows Greek, modern or ancient, you're like, well, that sounds a lot like the Greek word for peace. Well, the Greek word for peace is irene in, say, a koine pronunciation. It's epsilon iota, rho, eta, uh, nu, eta in the Greek, the English names of the letters. So so irene, modern Greek is pronounced irini. Um, and in classical Attic, it would have been irene for the, those of you out there who like that. The thing that's so interesting about it is in Coptic, it starts with an H sound, but it doesn't start with an H sound in Greek. So what's going on? It's the article. The Greek article in this word, the feminine article is he, meaning the. So he irene is the piece. Coptic doesn't do articles like that. So when they borrowed that word into Coptic from Greek and they're hearing he irene, he irene, they heard the H sound of the article and then they adopted the article with it, thinking that was part of the word when it isn't in Greek, it's just the article. Wow. And so I, this is why I wanted to have you on. I just learned so much in this last hour that oh, it, I, I'm so I'm I was very, very happy to be able to have you on. That is very fascinating stuff. Um, I would we'll definitely do this again soon. And um, I, I, like I, I, I got your link for your channel and your website, mm -hmm. uh, which is LukeRanieri.com. And I have uh, your your uh, YouTube in there as well. Any other links or any, anything else you want to promote? No, yeah, my two channels, which are uh, Polymathy and the other is Scorpio Martianus. But yeah, LukeRanieri.com has links to kind of all that anyway. So that's all good. All right. Appreciate and it. Thanks so much for having me. I really, uh, really appreciate the opportunity. I, I really you. appreciate you having, your t having you on. Thank you. And you have ascertained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.